My name is Spencer Snyder. Welcome to Breaking Points. Today, I want to talk about mass shootings, specifically how they are covered in the media. Uh, while I was watching The Five, which is something that no one should ever do, Greg Gutfeld, and I'm gonna say something I've never had occasion to say, Greg Gutfeld had a great point. Greg, as we know, with a lot of these shootings that we've unfortunately had to cover, there's a lot that is still gonna be made clear later on in, in days and weeks ahead. Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily need the information, to be honest with you. I mean, there is math to this. When a mass shooting occurs, there's an increased probability of another one within 13 days because of something called generalized imitation. That's when a person's behavior is amplified and influences other people's behavior to engage in similar actions. We know this happens with mass shootings. The World Health Organization has issued guidelines for suicide, so, um, reporting suicide to reduce the 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 incidence of copycats or imitational suicide. I really wish, you know, we sit here, we do this all the time. Oh boy, how, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? Look in the mirror. You know, we, we constantly, prominently place these stories. We repeat facts over and over again. The frequency plays a role. We provide step-by-step -step descriptions of the crime. We do not limit the use of photos or videos. We have live press events. What I'm talking about is we increase the spectacle of an event so that it stays in somebody's mind. The more you increase the fre frequency of a report, the more likely somebody's gonna hear it and be influenced by it. All I'm saying is treat this, change the reporting methods, finally. So the question is, does mass media coverage increase the number of shootings? Because the assertion here is that essentially, the way ABC, NBC, Fox, whoever, the way they cover mass shootings are not only not in the public's interest, it's dangerous. So let's examine some of what he said, because he's right about this. If the media use the guidelines for how to report on suicides for their coverage of shootings, it would be very different. The World Health Organization guidelines that Gutfeld is referring to is this, Preventing Suicide, a resource for media professionals. It essentially provides a list of do's and don'ts when reporting on suicides. Do provide accurate information about where to seek help. Do apply caution when interviewing bereaved family or friends. Don't place stories about suicide prominently and don't unduly repeat such stories. Don't explicitly describe the method used. The idea is essentially that you want to prevent contagion. So if you are reporting on a celebrity suicide, you don't want your reporting to be an advertisement for it. Because as it turns out, reports on suicide often lead to more. There have been over a hundred studies on this imitative behavior since the 70s, and the consensus is that media reports can make things worse. From a study on celebrity suicide reports in South Korea, they found that within just one day after news breaking, on average, the number of suicides in the population increased by 16.4%. Now, interestingly, this WHO report that Gutfeld referenced does have a section on mass shootings, and they link to a website called reportingonmassshootings.org, which has similar guidelines for news outlets. Let's just take a look at some of these guidelines and see if the same prudence that's typically applied to reporting on suicides is applied to reports on shootings. Present facts about the shooter and describe their behavior as illegal and harmful instead of stating the perpetrator's name frequently. Suspect Audrey Hale driving into the school. Audrey Hale. Audrey Hale. Hale's parents. Don't show graphic images of the crime scene. We have to warn you, the images you're about to see are disturbing. Okay, so you see where these examples are going, but I have just one more for you. If using photos of the perpetrator, only show the face and crop out weapons, uniforms, and other visual elements that might inspire copycats instead of showing images of the shooter with weapons or dressed in military-style clothing, as shown here in these reports illustrating what not to do. It's like these people read this infographic, but were told that it was actually a guide for how to maximize engagement when reporting on shootings, and then just did all of these things. Okay, so let's get back to this idea of contagion, because there is definitely a connection, but it's not quite as simple. So every 12.5 days, there is a mass shooting, and every 31.6 days, there is a school shooting. And the 13 days Gutfeld is referring to is this study that found significant evidence that mass killings involving firearms are incented by similar events in the immediate past. On average, 
this temporary increase in probability lasts 13 days. But the research doesn't appear to be totally clear that tons of coverage of one shooting always creates another out of whole cloth. It may be, for example, that the spectacle of recent active shootings contributes to the tragic crystallization of long simmering active shooting plants. And the data scientist who came up with the 13 days figure said, our model showed that there was this unusual bunching together in time, but that doesn't mean that all of them were necessarily due to a potential contagion effect, just some fraction of them. And our analysis found that was 20 to 30%. So unless I'm mistaken, I don't think it's quite as clean as there's a high profile shooting, thus shootings go up by X percent. But here's the thing, whatever the likelihood that coverage of one shooting leads to another days or weeks later, we know for sure that shootings are inspired by other shooters. Psychiatrist Deborah Weisbrot noted that a number of the would-be school shooters she evaluated, 114 over nine years, mentioned a desire to copy the crimes of other shooters. And it's not so hard to figure out where a bunch of kids who express desire to imitate school shooters would learn about them. Kids are not reading psychology journals. They are seeing the reports put out by the biggest news outlets in the country, which broadcast them on an endless loop, which for a would-be shooter can be a huge payoff. One study of the deadliest 31 mass shooters since 1966 found that 87% of mass shooters expressed an explicit or circumstantial desire for fame and attention. And in giving these shootings wall-to-wall -wall coverage, the media reminds the would-be shooter that infamy is potentially available to anyone who wants to go for it. But the idea that news outlets tempt these people with infamy is not new. The No Notoriety Movement and the Don't Name Them campaign started years ago, and the purpose is to urge news outlets to change the way they report and take away any notion someone might have that shooting up a school will grant them fame. But as we've just seen, the media seems to have no interest in doing that. Here is the founder of No Notoriety confronting Anderson Cooper. They want to be on television. They want to be infamous. We can stop it. We can't stop it. We can only get shot. CNN, Fox News, the major networks. Why don't you guys all come out with a policy that says, we're not going to show this again. We realize we made a mistake, but just so this never happens again, here's what we're going to do. That would, be my, that would be my challenge to you and to every network. And let's see who comes out with it first. I also think, I mean, I think a start also is not using this person's name, which, which, I don't know which what we're it not is. doing and, and very consciously, and, and sadly not everybody is following that policy. Now Anderson said they, meaning CNN, weren't using the shooter's name. And they were talking about the shooting at the theater in Aurora, Colorado in 2012. And in fairness, I couldn't find Cooper saying the name of the shooter in Nashville from late March, but CNN as a whole definitely is using the name. As the video continues, you see Hale start roaming the hallways. Police say Hale had three weapons. Media cling to these stories because they are sensational. They have urgency. There are developments in the story. You can satisfy our morbid fascination with true crime, and it's totally polarized, which is something that greatly increases the chances of something getting sustained coverage. Meaning that the right can use this to talk about how the left doesn't care about kids because they don't want to put armed guards in every single school. And liberals can use this as a vehicle for pundits to talk about how Republicans don't care about kids because they refuse to get along with common sense gun laws. Now, regardless of the validity of either side's arguments, because they are definitely not equal, that is part of how the networks use a story about a shooting. Case in point, after Greg Gutfeld gave his pretty reasonable piece on mass shooting coverage, this is what followed it change the reporting methods and treat it like we treat teen suicides, celebrity suicides. We do actually tamp down that coverage. Well, the White House has already blamed Republicans. Let's listen to Corinne Jean-Bierre. And that will do it for me. This one was on something obviously quite tragic, but hopefully you found some value in it. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to Breaking Points. You can also check out my YouTube channel where I talk all about media and politics and things. Uh, link in description. Liking and sharing this will always help. Thank you to Breaking Points. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.